beautifully made us in his image and likeness with this great destiny. We get to be with him forever when we leave this earth and it goes on and on. The kid's very impressed and she goes to the father then later when he gets home from work says, Daddy, I asked mommy where people are from. I wanted to hear what you say about it. Dad says, oh, sweetie, we came from monkeys and apes, you know, and we gives her all this evolution stuff. The little girl's confused. She goes back to the mom and says, Mom, you said we come from God and we're beautiful. Dad said we come from monkeys and gorillas, which is the truth. And the mother says, oh, honey, he was just talking about his side of the family. <laughs> All right, grab somebody's hand, let's pray. Ask God to bless the reading, the teaching of his word. Father, we thank you this morning for your precious Holy Spirit. We ask you to open the heavens above this place and pour out so much goodness. There's not enough room to receive it. Lord, touch every heart, touch every life, in Jesus' name. And everybody says? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, uh, I want to talk to you today about dead men walking. Anybody ever heard that phrase? There's actually a movie in the 90s about that. And uh, the movie was about a man who was sentenced to death. I didn't really see the movie. But uh, also, uh, it's, a, a, it's a phrase that can mean somebody that's going to die or somebody that something bad is going to happen to or whatever. And uh, it's a fairly common phrase. But today I want to talk to you about dead men walking. And I want to just begin with a little foundation. First of all, how many of you know that God required animal sacrifice before Jesus came? Yeah, the, the burning of the killing and the burning of goats and bulls and so forth. And he did this to provide, uh, one, a temporary covering for sins for people because Jesus hadn't come yet, pay for our sins. And number two, to foreshadow the perfect and complete work of Christ that was yet to happen. In Jesus' sacrifice, then he came, and of course he died on the cross for you and I, for all of our sins, for all time. Uh, it says that in Hebrews. No more animal sacrifices were needed. And let's read this scripture in Hebrews. Uh, and where's Matthew today, my reader? Okay. Somebody else want to read? Anybody? Come on, Dustin. Okay, all right. Why don't we read this together, and then, uh, Danny, you can handle the rest of them. Read it with me, Hebrews 7. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for sins of the people. Because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. And how many of you heard the phrase once and for all? Uh, there's people that say this phrase was created in the 1530s, but actually this phrase came out of the scripture, once and for all. Jesus died once, instead of the, the constant sacrificing of bulls and goats, he died once and he paid for all the sins of all mankind forever. It's, it's amazing. It's because he was the sinless Lamb of God. He was the Son of God. And his death, his sacrifice counted for everybody. So all of our sins have been paid for by Jesus' sacrifice. That's pretty good news, isn't it? How many of you are glad your sins have been paid for? Amen. Me too, man. I wouldn't want all that stuff counted against me. And as ordinary as I am, Pastor Lee was way worse. And uh, I don't even know you're going to get into Danny. That's just like, it's a whole other level there, but... Uh, let's look at Romans 12.1. And uh, Danny, can you read that? Brothers and sisters, in light of all I have shared with you about God's mercies, I urge you to offer your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice to God. A sacrifice offering that brings him pleasure. It is your reasonable, essential worship. So you might think that, well, now, you know, bulls and goats and all that don't have to be sacrificed, so there doesn't need to be any more sacrifices. But... Because Jesus sacrificed himself for all of our sins, that doesn't mean that there are no sacrifices left to be made. I've got good news and bad news for you today. The good news is, God doesn't want bulls and goats on that altar anymore. Bad news is, he wants you there instead. 
Ouch. That, that could be a pretty ouchy thing. And no, he's not talking about burning you at the stake, although there's a couple of you that probably deserve it, but uh, <laughs> the sacrifice he wants from us is obedience. And sometimes, honestly, being his <laughs> choice is I can be a shish kebab or I can be obedient, sometimes it'd be easier to just be a shish kebab, just put some, you know, uh, uh, barbecue sauce on myself and, you know, but the concept of dying to self, it's found throughout the New Testament. I mean, dying to yourself is, is part of being born again. And the old self dies when you're born again. You know, your old desires die. They go to the cross with Christ. And you're uh, coming forth in, you know, newness of life. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus, the Bible says. So not only are Christians born again when we come to salvation, but we continue dying to self. That's part of the process of sanctification, isn't it? Yeah, sanctification. Does anybody know what that means? Sanctify. What does that mean? Yeah, separated, set apart by God. Set apart for God's use, okay? So, we're dying to self, and it's both a one-time event. It's also a lifelong process. Now, I want to be a little bit gross here for a moment. The, the smell of death, the smell of burning flesh, literally speaking, is actually pretty nasty. I went to the doctor some years ago. I had skin tags. My dad had them. I get them. How many of you know what a skin tag is? Yeah, they're, and they stick out. And you'd think that, oh, that it hurts just like you cut your skin. You cut a skin tag off. It's just like taking a knife and just sticking it in yourself. No matter how long that thing is, it's just, it's like part of you. And so cutting them off can be a little unpleasant. And uh, my doctor, I had a couple big ones, and he used little shots even to, you know, numb the pain. And then he cut them off, and I've had that done two or three times. The last time I had it done, though, he said, I've got a new thing I want to do that they didn't do uh, the last couple times. I said, what's that? He said, I want to, after I cut them off, I want to cauterize them. Do you know what cauterization is? He burns it, and the burning it does two things. It closes up the wound, and it also is a purification thing. Like any germs that are there, it, it kills the germs. And so he, you know, he numbed me, and he cut, cuts one off, and then he starts burning me. And I couldn't feel it because I, you know, numbed it, but I could smell it. When you smell yourself cooking, that's not a great thing. And I thought, well, you know, I've cooked steaks on the grill, and ribs, and oh, chicken, and you know, Mike knows, he's helped me cook a lot of, smells great, doesn't it? I thought, well, if that's, those animals smell great, I gotta smell double great, because after all, it's me, you know? And uh, it was nasty smell, just kind of a, uh, nothing, I can't really describe it. it. It doesn't compare to anything else. I disliked it. As much as we dislike the smell of burning flesh, figuratively speaking, it, that smell is a smell that God loves it causes him to come near. And I'm speaking figuratively now, it's the smell of someone dying to self. When that happens, it actually attracts God, and he loves it. In fact, the more death to self that he smells among his people, the closer he can come. Why is that? Yeah, it's kind of a, you know, why is it that that, that draws God? What is it about the smell of burning self, flesh. That yeah, that's right. Did you hear what he said? Repeat that one more time. That was really good. That is an absolutely great and correct statement. Why was it when Jesus died on the cross, he said, at one point he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt, and why did God separate from Jesus at that moment? Sin. Because all the sins, every sin in this room that's ever been committed, not only ours, but all the sins of all humankind, not only at that time, but forever, past, present, while he was on the earth, and future. 
All the sins that are yet to come was all laid on Jesus at that moment on the cross. And God is a holy God. And so God, looking at his son whom he loved, had to turn his face away from Christ for just for that moment because the sin, the filth. Just imagine every, every pedophile, every murderer, every thief, every, all the sins combined, every adulterer, every, every liar, all of it was laid on this holy, sinless Lamb of God to the point where the Father, who Jesus had spent 33 and a half years in constant communion with, constant communication with God. God said, this is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. He said it publicly for everyone to hear. At that moment, God had to turn away. And for the first time in the life of Jesus Christ, he was separated, cut off from his Father. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? 1 Corinthians one twenty nine says, and read it out loud. No flesh should glory in his presence. That's why. That's why God, when he smells death to self happening in his church, it draws him. Because with that death, it's not death to your personality. God loves your personality. You understand the difference, I hope. Jimmy, he loves the fact that you beat me in chess. I hate it personally, but God loves it, okay? God loves the quirks in all of you, and the, the, you know, Christina, how funny your laugh is, and Esteban, how ornery you are, and he loved the Godfather, and on and on and on. He loves, you know, the way that you drum, play the drums, Dave, and Joy, he loves the way he, that you put up with Dave, you know. <laughs> Which you, by the way, I, I've, God gave me a vision of the size of the reward that you're going to get just for that. It's huge. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah, sure, brother. No problem. <laughs> I always aim to please. You know that. God loves your personality, but God, he loves you, but he hates sin at the same time. He has to because he's holy. He's pure. He's magnificent. Heaven is a beautiful, incredible place, and it's, and it's part of it's because of just the purity of it all. We live in such a sin-tainted, sin-cursed world, don't we? You go to work, people cuss and they say, you know, it's just, you, it's hard to get away from the filth. You almost have to isolate yourself. And then you become a hermit, and God doesn't want that. He wants us among other people. It's difficult. No, God says, no flesh will glory in my presence. So when God's people start to obey and start to turn away from sin and start to really live their lives the way that God planned for them to live, the smell of flesh, carnality, okay, sinful carnality, rises like a sacrifice. It smells so much better to God than goats and calves and bulls that was just a foretaste that was a preview of what was going to happen inside of us through the circumcision of the flesh and that's a whole other message so now let me ask you this question what kind of things cause us to burn well we can talk about a lot of different things you know, i remember the old saying you don't uh what is it now you don't smoke and you don't chew and you don't go with the girls that do remember that walt that was uh and I'd like to say I never went with any girls that did any of those things, but I, you know, but most of the time I did. But, so God just, you know, here's, the, let me just capsulize it. The essence of all of this is that when we want to go one way, and yet we know God wants us to go another way, we have choices to make at that moment. And whatever you choose determines whether or not God has that fragrant aroma that he loves, or God has to turn away for that moment. What are some of the New Testament sacrifices that please God? Sacrifices of obedience. Let's look at a few of them. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Therefore, by him, Jesus, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. All right, so the one, one very, I'm just being very simple here to start with. The first one we want to talk about is continual praise and thanksgiving. 
It says, with the fruit of our what? Our minds? The fruit of our ears, our armpits? I mean, what is it? The fruit of our what? Lips. What does that mean? I mean, what are you, what's he talking about? Saying it out loud. Would you say? You've got to speak it out. You have to. Okay, Danny, you're a great guy. I'm going to praise you right now for something. Are you ready? Here it goes. This is going to blow you away. Ready? No, I didn't think you were, yeah. Wait, let me be more sincere. Okay, yeah. ready? <laughs> that's pretty nasty, isn't it? <laughs> I can't even see myself, but I thought, oh, that's really nasty. All right. You can't really praise somebody. You gotta, you've got to speak it. Even if you give them a real nice look, they still don't know what you're praising them for, you see. God has so many things we can praise him for. Things that he's done for us. Things that he's done throughout human history, who he is, his personality, his love. The Bible says God is light, God is life, God is love. I mean, it's just all these wonderful attributes. And our, the history of our lives, what he's done for us, just saving us was a big deal, wasn't it, Goldie? Yeah. Where would we be if not for his salvation that he purchased for us? Thank. I mean, so we have so much to praise him for. And yet, it's incredible because we have words for almost everything else that we care about, right? Oh, the Browns won a game. Oh my goodness, can you believe it? They kicked a field goal. I, I know this is just fantasy. <laughs> right, That's fake. who said fake news? <laughs> that, is, that is the truth, yeah. <laughs> my goodness, I mean, yeah. Oh, boy, I got this new car, I'm really, I'm really excited. Or. Man, I found a you know ten dollar bill on the floor at the grocery store. You know, and we blah, 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 you know all the words we speak, and yet when it comes time to praise God, it's we're like kind of like, you know, the worship team's doing their thing up here, and and a lot of people are praising God, and there's some people that are just kind of singing songs, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with just singing songs, but that's a time of corporate praise and worship. There's also personal praise, private praise. Those, when you're just, when it's just you and him, you see. And so, with the fruit of our lips, that's an important part. Okay, so it says, by him, by Jesus, let us continually, that, what does continually mean? Constantly. It doesn't mean when we feel like it. In fact, it means when we feel like it and when we don't feel like it. That's why it calls it, let us continually offer the what? The, the say that again? Well, I know there's more than five people here today. The what? The sacrifice of praise. Yeah. Sometimes praise is easy. Oh, man, I got a raise at work last week, and everything went well, and the boss was really nice to me, and, it, you know, I got to train some new people, and they really look up to me, and I feel really great. Well, it's easy to praise God during that week, isn't it? How about when you have too, much, too many bills at the end of the money? Right? Yeah. Month is over. Some of your bills are paid, some are not. You don't know where the next dollar is going to come from. That's when praise becomes a sacrifice. Because emotionally, you might not be feeling way up here. You might be kind of down in the valley somewhere. And God wants to praise him in the dark times, as well as the good. And I understand that it's not always easy, but I also want you to know that that is something that really touches God's heart. Any praise, any time, any thankfulness, you know, we thank him, that touches God's heart no matter what the state of our being is. But when it's the sacrifice of praise, it's special to God. Philippians 4.18, you want to read that, Danny? But I have received everything in full and more. I am amply supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent me. There are the fragrant aroma of an offering, an acceptable sacrifice, which God welcomes and in which he delights. Yeah, so he's talking about tithes and offerings here. He's talking about giving of finances or possibly personal belongings. And he says they're a fragrant aroma. He's talking about that as just as if you were sacrificing a bull and goat in the Old Testament. There's an aroma that goes up to heaven when people give to God financially. 
David said in the Old Testament, he said, shall I give to my God that which costs me nothing? You see, God loves that, the sacrifice. Your money goes towards the things you value most in this universe, truly. It doesn't matter what you say, what matters is what you do. And so, and here's the thing about money. People say time is money, but also money is time. Because we get money by investing our time, typically, unless we get an inheritance or something, in some kind of work. Even if you are on retirement or SSI or whatever, you, that came from your taxes that you paid when you were working. You follow? So the, the money that most of us receive come from the investment of our lives. It's, that's why it's important to people. And so when you give your money towards something that you don't have to, now, it's one thing to you know, pay your bills and buy food and things that you need. It's another thing to voluntarily give to a worthy cause, and the most worthy cause of all certainly is the kingdom of God. And so tithing, what tithing is, is saying, I am going to trust a God who always comes through. I believe that my God always comes through. Always. Yeah, and therefore I'm going to give him, out of the ten that he, that he provides for me, I'm going to give him one. I, re I work and I receive ten dollars, God gets the first one. That still leaves nine. Right? That's plenty if you're, you know, a good steward of your finances. Oftentimes, tithing, like clockwork, is the beginning of bringing spiritual order to the rest of your life. I've noticed this over 32 years, that people that really say, okay, God, I'm going to start there, because when you start there, you're starting with your very life, your very essence, okay? I, you know, you, not a lot of people love to go to work. I love my job, some of you may love your, but a lot of people work jobs that they don't particularly like. They'd rather be retired, they'd rather travel, they'd rather have fun, they'd rather play paintball or, you know, join a bowling league or play tennis or just, you know, have a coin collection or whatever interests them, okay? But you, you work because we, we all need money to live. And so that investment is, is it's, you're investing your very essence and you're going to invest it in something that is meaningful to you. So I see a lot of people, they've got money for cigarettes, but not money for God. They have money to eat out, but not money for God. They have money to go to the ball game, but not money for God. They have money for cable vision, but not money for God. They have money for, I could go on and on, couldn't I? It's because God is not first in that area of their lives, you see. Now, when you make God first in an area of your life, see, I'm not going to talk about, you know, when you tithe, that God blesses you, which he does. He truly does. Your needs are met. I'm not going to talk about tremendous prosperity right at this moment, although I could. I'm going to, what I'm talking about right now, some of the other benefits of tithing that you don't always hear about from pastors, and one is order. Order. First things first. What is first in your life? And your money shows what is truly first in your life. Is everybody wanting to kill me now? I mean, like, <laughs> don't look at me in that tone of voice. You know I'm right. There's one other area of sacrifice I want to talk to you about. But how many of you think I was right about what I just said? How many of you think I was wrong about what I just said? doesn't matter, I love you anyway. You, you have every right to be completely wrong. I just want to tell you that. Danny, read First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Like living stones, allow yourselves be assembled in a spiritual house, a holy order of priests who offer up spiritual sacrifices that will be acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, the anointed. All right, so the third sacrifice is simply going to church faithfully. Now, as the scripture, and I researched the scripture, this was the, the most the clear of all the translations that I found with the original Greek. You have to allow, you have to let yourself be assembled. God wants people to be assembled. 
if you're watching on live stream today, um, God wants you to be with his people somewhere. He wants you to meet with a group of his people. That's why in Hebrews he said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. That scripture says, do it all the more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. This scripture says we've got to be willing to allow ourselves to be assembled into a spiritual house, which is what this is. This is one of many, many spiritual houses all over the planet that are meeting today. They're getting together to worship God, to hear his word, amen? And how many of you like what we're doing today? How many of you like this? Oh, I love it. I just absolutely love it. Going to church faithfully is a matter of simple obedience to Christ. Simple obedience. It's a yes, you know, assembling is a yes or no question. You're going to assemble with my people or not? You say you're a Christian. Are you going? See, that's one of the very basic things that shows someone is a Christian. It cracks me up, honestly, when people say, oh, I have to go to church today. Or I have to pay my tithes. It just, it cracks me up because, you know, I mean, ask, if you ask my family, <coughs> if you ask Cindy and me, we would, we don't say that. We don't say, oh, I have to go to church, oh, I have to, we, you know what we say? I love to go to church and I love to pay my tithes. It's a matter of attitude. It's not about have to. If you're thinking you've got to do this, oh, it's this dutiful, horrible thing, your mentality is really screwed up. Maybe it got screwed up by a preacher somewhere, maybe just your own stupidity. I don't know. I mean, a lot of stupidity running around, isn't it? It's kind of a, a disease that seems to be going all over our country right now. Have you noticed that? Massive stupidity. We won't get into, you know, but I mean, some such obvious things. And yet people are forcing themselves to look away from that which is simple and obvious and what has worked for us as a nation for well, how many years now? Since 1776, I mean 200 and whatever, 40 years, I don't know if my math is that good, but it's the same thing here. It's very, very simple, the things that I'm sharing with you. Look at um, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Go ahead, Danny. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to get into some meatier stuff. And simply, I want to say this. We're looking for breakthrough. God's looking for brokenness. The reason a lot of people don't have breakthroughs, they're not willing to be broken. Amen. They don't want to accept the yoke of Jesus Christ, which is not hard. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's, this is not a hard, this is not rocket science. It's not brain surgery here, okay? We want life. God is looking for death. We want breakthrough. God's looking for brokenness. Out of brokenness comes breakthrough. We get the cart before the horse sometimes. And a lot of it is just due to, to preaching and so forth, the people's bent on things. Exodus 33, 20, Danny, you want to read that? But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. See, we talk about and we sing about wanting face-to-face -face intimacy with God. But here's the thing. <laughs> Only, no man can see his face and live. So what does that tell us? That tells you that only dead men can get close enough. Yeah, to see him face to face. I'm talking about death to self now. If you go up to a, uh, per, you know, a corpse in a casket and you wave a you know, million dollars in front of the corpse's face, he's not going to get excited, is he? No. You bring in a dancing girl, he's not going to lust after this girl. You bring him an opportunity to steal or to sin in any way, He's not going to respond. Why? He's dead. When you're dead to sin and you reckon yourself, you know, Dave taught in this a couple weeks ago on Wednesday, when you reckon, or it simply means when you recognize the fact that you were crucified with Christ, therefore you're dead to sin, there's a lack of responsiveness to opportunities to disobey God. You don't respond because you've you're dead to that. 
As soon as I got saved, I just immediately died to certain things. Immediately, I just didn't want to do those things anymore. Didn't want to smoke, I didn't want to smoke pot, I didn't want to run with the wrong crowd, I didn't want to be in certain places. When I was like, I don't know, 20, I was still single. A couple of my friends who had one foot in the world, one foot in the church, they said, hey, you want to go to a movie? I said, sure. Let's stop at this one place and get some refreshments. Well, took me to a club in Fairlawn. Now, you have to understand, I was saved when I was 15, and I, when I got saved, I really meant it. I really got saved. I had never been in a club. This was not a sleazy bar. This was up in Fairlawn. It was an upscale club, but it was a place where men meet women. You know, they go home together. There was drinking going on. I was there for about 10 minutes, and I said to these other two guys who didn't have any problem being there at all, I have a problem being here. This is, place is not for me. It's not where I belong. Let's get out of here. So, okay, and they felt convicted, and I wasn't trying to make them feel bad on purpose. I just walked in, and I'm like, no. I was made for something better than this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't made for this. Take me out of here. We talk about wanting face-to-face -face intimacy, and yet only dead people can see his face. In the Old Testament, when the priests went into the Holy of Holies, they tied a rope around their ankles. Right. This was not like a style thing, okay? Uh, they tied a rope around their ankle because they were going into the holiest place on the planet. And they did sacrifices. They did the bulls or the goats or whatever. They sacrificed animal to pay for the sins before they sent this poor guy in there. How would you like if they started tying the rope to your ankle and they sent you in there? I mean, that's a little scary. It's a little daunting, isn't it? But if those sins were not atoned for properly, what happened to this poor guy? He died. And then it's like, okay, who's next? You know. All of a sudden you turn around, all the other priests are gone. Like, uh, Sometimes they tied a bell to the guy. They sent him in there. Why is that? Because if he dropped, you'd hear ding a ling a ling What an unfortunate. You know, it's like, this is hardly jingle bells. Uh, another one bites the dust. You know, like yank him out of there. Um. A lot of Christians, they want services, church services that entertain. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with having great music, great sermons, etc. I mean, there's nothing wrong with entertainment per se, but if that's all you want, then there's a problem. You've been raised wrong. You need to get some of that stuff out of you. Because um, a lot of Christians want services that entertain them, but they don't want anything that challenges them. Don't talk to me about righteousness, Pastor Mike. Don't talk to me about discipleship. Don't talk to me about character, you know. Let's just have a move of the Spirit every single week. Let's have people praying for each other and all of this, you know, and that's wonderful. I mean, I love that. But it's incomplete if you don't deal with some of the meat and potatoes. If you're always serving candy and you're never serving spinach, that's you're raising up spoiled children who can't really handle anything more. There are a lot of Christians, they want something that keeps their mind occupied, but if it starts to smell a little bit smoky in the place, they start looking for the door. Oh, this isn't, this isn't f the fun thing that I, what, what is this? Entertain me, please, dance for me. Where's the puppets? Where's the, you know, the acrobats? Where's the, you know, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of believers go to churches that entertain and really don't ever challenge. And there are churches like that. How many of you know that? The problem is that when you go to a church like that, you never learn to deal with yourself. People that go to churches that just entertain, they never learn to deal with their issues or grow in Christ. They rotate over and over through the same issues that they've had all their lives. 
And they don't understand why. Why didn't I get the big breakthrough the pastor's been promising? Why didn't I, you know, why, I, I mean, I've, why is there no breakthrough in my marriage? Why is there no breakthrough in my finances? Why? I don't understand. Because sometimes you just have to stick yourself on the altar and say, okay, all right, God, okay. Go ahead and, you know, get the magnifying glass, put the burn or whatever this issue is that's ruining my marriage or ruining my life in some way, ruining my relationships. What is my personal responsibility? Help me. That's not easy to do. How many of you know that? It's so hard to, it's just really easy to look at the other person. Right? It's my husband's fault. If he was just more or less or whatever, it's my wife's fault. She would just stop, blah, blah, blah. It's my, you know, we used to be friends with this person, but they started doing this, and you never look, what did I do? What can I learn? One of the things that I often tell people is, if you've got an issue with someone else, whoever it is in your life, even if they're this much wrong, if you were this much wrong, you still, you have to deal with your own stuff. Or you're never going to learn anything. And if you don't have somebody that will tell you these things, they're doing you a disservice. Isn't that right? Faithful are the wounds of a friend rather than what? The kisses of an enemy. I'd rather have the wounds of a friend than the kisses from an enemy. Say what you got to say. Be gentle with me. Be respectful. Be loving. But go ahead and say it. Help me out. Help me. You know, death to self has been present in every revival throughout history. You know, you only hear about the, fan, the outstanding, the miraculous stuff. Martin Luther was persecuted. Jonathan Edwards was persecuted. I mean, all these people, they would pass notes. You know, there wasn't social media. There wasn't even television or radio. They'd write letters. Don't let, don't let this Jonathan Edwards come near your church. He preaches about sinners in the hands of an angry God and people actually fall down. That's just, that's satanic, you know. And they would send notes to each other. Don't let, oh, he's a cult leader. You know, now he's revered as one of the great evangelists and great revivalists of all Christian history. But at that time, he was persecuted. John Wesley, I mean, you name a name. D.L. Moody, they all got persecuted, man. They all suffered for serving Christ. Uh, I remember years ago, Kenneth Hagin, who was the, the father of the modern faith movement, the faith movement was known for its positivity. He preached a message, and the title was Suffering. And he talked in that message, he talked for over an hour about all the ways that he had suffered, all the persecution that he had gone through since entering the ministry. And how difficult it was at times to remain obedient to God in the face of that persecution. He, you know, he said, I love, I've adopted this phrase. He said, you talk about criticism. He said, I've been criticized by experts. You know, and I just, you know, and I use that phrase sometimes. And, and if you do anything for God for any length of time, you're going to be criticized. That's, yeah, yeah, because persecution... God uses persecution in a variety of ways to purify us, to strengthen us. We talk about, as good spirit-filled people, we like to talk about the Azusa Street Revival, the turn of the century. It was born out of the Welsh Revival, and then it came to the United States. And William Seymour, who was the central figure, who's an African-American preacher, you know, people talk about the miracles and the move of the Spirit, but you don't hear very much talk about the fact that he would pray all night They'd have all-night prayer meetings, and he would put his head in an apple crate, weeping and praying to God for the move of God, you see. In Argentina in the 1950s, one of the greatest revivals recorded in history. There was some Assembly of God people, and there was, you know, spiritual people. And at the time that they were trying to reach out, I mean, it was just, they had reached out for years, missionaries. Argentina was loaded with sin. And uh, many missionaries had tried and failed. And so at the time, there was like, I think, uh, let me see, I wrote it down. 
There was a total of 600 spirit-filled Christians that they could find in the entire country of Argentina. That's incredible, isn't it? Just 600? Yeah, that is a one low-burning candle. You're right. And so these Bible students got such a burden from God. And everybody, they tried everything. All the smart, they rented, I heard one, they rented a huge tent, pooled all their funds. They went for a long time, every single night, meeting in this tent. Nobody came. They had great music, great preaching. Nobody sitting there. And this, nothing they did was working. They tried all the practical stuff, all the, you know, and then finally, you just got a bunch of young Bible students that just started weeping. Just weeping for the country, praying, interceding, praying in the Spirit. And they spent 49 days like that. 49 days of weeping and intercession. Just allowing God to put a burden on them for this country. And out of that, what happened was one of the hugest revivals. They were packing soccer stadiums 180,000 people from 600 total every night and the spirit was, would move over the crowd in waves. People were getting saved. They were getting filled with the spirits speaking in tongues by the hundreds and thousands. So it went from 600 spirit-filled believers to thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people being swept into the kingdom spirit-filled baptized by the Holy Spirit, praying in the Spirit, reaching out, getting other people saved. One of the most powerful moves of God. There is more I could tell you about that, more details, but you should read about it sometime. A lot of the great things uh, is born through obedience, born through willingness to suffer for God, to sacrifice for Him. I went to uh, Ukraine a couple times, and uh, long trips like three weeks at a time and uh one trip we were we had uh, rented a camp i didn't realize until we got there this for years had been a communist training camp you talk about the spirit of antichrist this place was loaded with it years and years of training atheistic communists who would persecute christians i mean just you know and you could just feel it when you got there and so we were there for a week it was one out of three weeks we were at this camp. And we had a, a lot of people coming to this camp. And I was preaching every, every evening. And, uh, the, and very successful preaching. People were getting saved. People were getting, uh, there was healings. There was discipleship that was happening. Now the thing was that the missionaries that had started this church, there's several churches, and he had a couple of elders. The head missionary and his elders, they were Baptists. Now, if you know anything about, there's a lot of Baptists who just don't want the move of the Spirit. They want everything controlled, you know, and I don't mean to be insulting. It's just their doctrine. It's a doctrine that's been perpetuated in some, not all, some Baptist circles. And so I was in this group, and uh, the head guy, his name was Eric. And Eric's a great guy. In fact, I just contacted him recently. I'm hoping that we can get together sometime soon. Eric, if you're watching, hi, he's in the United States right now. Spent so much of his life on the mission field, just giving his life for God, for God's people. And uh, the last night that I was preaching, we had great success, people, more and more people coming every evening. I asked Eric permission. <coughs> I said, Eric, I'd like to preach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's up to you. I won't do it if you don't allow me. Because you respect whoever the authority is. Whether you agree or not, that's not the issue. You respect them. That's God's order. That's protocol. Amen. And Eric says to me, you know, Mike, I know it's biblical. I went to a school that taught against, very hard against healing and speaking in tongues and prophesying and anything having to do with the nine gifts of the Spirit. They were, his school was Bob Jones University, if anybody you know. It's like the, the most cessationist, you know, they're right in their philosophy. It's like, if it moves, shoot it. Okay. And so, yeah, blam. And so, uh, so there was one proviso. He gave permission. There's one proviso, and that is that I could not speak about speaking in tongues. I could teach about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that it's for power to be witnesses unto him, but you're not allowed to mention tongues. I said, that's okay. 
So, now, you have to understand, there was tremendous anointing, tremendous success up until that evening. So I get out there, and I had a young, a 20-year-old Baptist translator who had been translating for me this whole trip. Good translator, his name was Vladimir. And uh, I started, and it was horrible. Every few seconds there was a distraction. Someone would drop something, someone would go to the bathroom, someone would fall out of their chair, not with by under the spirit. I mean, every just clanging and, I mean, you just name it. And I don't know if you've, how many of you have ever spoken a group anywhere? Anybody spoken publicly in any way, speech class or whatever. So, all right, when you're talking to people, it's helpful when you have their attention, but when you're talking to them and there's constant distraction, they're all going, and you just, it's, you feel like you're just uttering words with no purpose. And so I'm talking up there, and, and then I, and Vladimir, and let me just tell you what the cause of it was. There was so much spiritual warfare. There was so much demonic oppression that evening that it was visibly darker. And remember, I'd been preaching in this building. We had all of our meals there. I'd been preaching in this auditorium. And it was visibly darker. That's how horrendous. I would say the simplest thing. God loves you. Waiting for Vladimir to speak in Russian. And Vladimir would go, uh, uh. he couldn't hardly talk. It was like having your teeth pulled slowly, one at a time. It's how painful this was. It was almost embarrassing. It was, there was so much confusion and so much distraction. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I'm not making a lick of sense. I don't even know what I'm saying. It was so, so, and I didn't, you know, I wasn't reading notes. I just, usually I make a few notes and I didn't know what in the world I was doing anymore. My translator was almost useless. I'm going to tell you, I died a thousand deaths getting that message out. I mean, it was horrendous, and I ended up, I cut it short. I think I spoke for like 25, 30 minutes, and it was pure hell, let me just tell you. And I really, I just wanted to stop and walk off of the platform and go to my dorm room and curl up in a fetal position. <laughs> and suck my thumb and say, Mommy, Mommy. I mean, that's how bad it was that night. But I noticed that my team also saw, I had a team with me, and they were scattered among the crowd, and I started seeing them. They bowed their heads, and I started, they were praying in the Spirit, which was helpful. Even so, though, none of the people were focused on what I was saying. So I'm like, they're not learning, they're not really getting anything about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. At the end of it all, kind of out of a sense of duty, I just, you know, because I kind of had to, it was the title, I said, all right, well, anybody here want to get baptized in the Holy Spirit? I'm thinking probably not. I'll be safe in my dorm room away from this misery. And to my shock and amazement, every single person in attendance came forward to receive. Every single Russian-speaking person came up to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not only that, cooking staff started coming out of the kitchen. They were hearing, they wanted to receive it. The janitorial people, the camp counselors, all these people come, and there was this huge crowd at the altar and I was standing there going, uh, uh. <laughs> I didn't know I could be so bad and God could be so good. You know, it's funny because a few weeks ago, Dave, you know, I talked about people saying, oh, it's all God, it's all God. All right, well, no, it's, it is a cooperative effort. But in this case, it was about 90% God. <laughs> and I'm being generous with myself, giving myself 10, you know. And frankly, my translator gets about negative one. <laughs> and so every human being came forward in that demonized, atheistic, communist camp to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm like, I can't do every person that's, I'll be here all night. So I enlisted, I got my friend Esley who had planned the trip. And I got Eric, who was the head of the mission, the Baptist guy, okay? At that time, I don't know, I don't think Esley had, I know Esley had received the baptism by faith. 
I don't think he had ever gotten his prayer language. I'm not sure. I knew Eric had, because Eric was raised at you know, Bob Jones University. He, he wasn't even totally sure. He believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit at that point. We had talked about it. He was starting to open up to it. But he hadn't been filled with the Spirit. I said, listen, I need you guys. I know you, this is not, it wasn't planned, but look at all these people. I need you guys to have prayer lines and just pray. And I, and I told him what to do. I said, just put your hands on their head. And you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? If they say yes in Russian, then say, all right, receive it. I mean, I didn't have time to teach them anything else. It wasn't like ministry class where I taught some of you guys how to you know, answer objections or help people. And so they did that, and we had these three long lines going all the way back to the end of the building. And what happened was these guys, they just did what I told them to do. Do you want it? Receive it now in Jesus' name, and bang. Every person was receiving it, and every person was speaking in other tongues. How do I know that? Because I know what Russian sounds like. This guy's sounding Latina here. For This guy sounded like he's come from Switzerland. And you know, you just, you get a sense of, and so they're all, even though I had not even mentioned a prayer language. And even if I had, nobody heard most of what I was saying anyway. I could have been just sitting up there going, I'm, 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 you know, it's like nothing. Every single person in that room, all the counselors, everybody received the baptism. Bang. They're speaking in other tongues. I, could, I got letters for years from some of those people. What was going on with their walks? You know, I get a letter from the Ukraine, you know, and I'm like, wow, and this person, oh, boy, it meant so much to me that night when I got filled with the Holy Spirit and just incredible. Let's do our last scripture, Danny. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Be conformed to his death. A lot of people want the power of his resurrection. They want to know him. But uh, many people, they shy away from the fellowship of his sufferings. I'm not saying it's pleasant, but I want to just tell you this. So next time you feel a little heat, let God have his way. Don't be so quick to jump off of that altar. Remember, dying to yourself brings him closer. And when he smells burning flesh, so to speak, he knows that someone is choosing to obey him. And he loves that. He draws to that. Let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you for the good. We also thank you that you use some of the difficult things in life. That everything works together for our good. For those that love God, for those that are the called according to your purpose, all things, even the negative things, work together for good. We ask you to burn these words, burn these scriptures, burn the theme of this message into our hearts. Give us, we want more depth in you. We want to go deeper in you. We understand that understanding the fellowship of your sufferings is part of depth being worked into our lives. We're willing today to, to receive that. Just pray this prayer with me. Say, thank you, Father, for your work in my life. Give me patience. To understand your process. Give me a deeper understanding of how you use everything and you cause all things to work together for my good. I'll do my best when it's obvious that you're working in me in this way. I'll do my best to not jump off the altar. To not put off what you want to accomplish. But to learn the lessons that you're trying to teach me in a specific area of my life. I ask you for wisdom. Help me to grow in wisdom. Help me to become more. Help me to become better. Not just for myself. 
but for all those whose lives I touch. I want to be a better friend, a better spouse, a better parent, a better child. Thank you for your work in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Does everybody here know the Lord? If there's anybody here that you're not certain, you're not sure 100%, that if, God forbid, if something happened and you, your life here on earth would end today, if there's anybody here that is not certain that you'd be with Jesus Christ forever, I'd like to just have, give you an opportunity to receive him right now. Would you bow your heads one more time with me, please? If what I said describes you, you're not certain. And let me just say this. If someone is a Christian, they are certain. If you ask someone who is born again, someone who knows Christ, are you a Christian? Their answer is absolutely, 100%. Because the Bible says you may know. You can know that you have eternal life. Something you either have or you don't have. 1 John chapter 5 says... If you have the Son of God, you have life. And if you don't have Him, you don't have life. You either have eternal life through the Son or you don't. There's no in-between. There's no saying, I hope I'm saved, I hope I go to heaven. No. Either you are or you aren't. And if you don't know for sure, let me just tell you, 100%, you're not. You can change that in just a moment. Just a flicker. You can change all of that. You can change your eternal destiny. If you're here this morning, you're not sure, just lift your hand up so I can see it real quick. Nobody's looking except for me. And of course, God. Everybody, if, all right, everybody here that knows Christ and you know that you're a Christian, raise your hand right now. Praise God. I think that's everybody. If not, raise your hand right now. Or we're going to move on. All right, stand up with me today. I want to bless you all in the name of Jesus. I bless you for coming to church, for putting God first this morning. Bless your coming in and your going out. I pray that everything you touch turns to gold, that God, and God is going to bless everywhere that the sole of your feet walks today and forever. If you walk in God's favor, you walk close to Him, He's going to give you every place the sole of your feet touches. And He's going to cause the work of your hands to blossom. Amen. I bless you with that in Jesus' name. Thanks for coming today. We'll see you Wednesday night at 6.30. God bless you. Yeah, let's give the Lord a clap offering. That's a good way to answer. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen.